Okay. Um, hello, and thank you for, for inviting me here today to talk about our work on the IPASS project. Um, the IPASS project is based in the University of Glasgow and is exploring the overlap between the two domains of um, archaeological prospection and precision ag, agriculture. Um, specifically with the view to uh, um, thinking about sharing data and making data shareable. So it specifically focuses on the interoperability of data between the do two domains. So what is precision agriculture? It's a contemporary farming method that adopts new technologies to um, first instance, decrease inputs, save on costs, um, increase its outputs, make a profit, and thirdly, um, to farm sustainably. And in our current climate of um, uh, environmental issues, this has become uh, an important point. There are incentives for farmers to farm sustainably. And if you want to hear more about this and more, more about the larger context of the IPASS project, I recommend my colleagues Rachel Opitz's talk on Friday morning ses session, where she'll go into that side of things in, in more detail. But the purpose of today's paper is to focus a little bit on the similarities in data types between precision agriculture and archaeological prospection. You'll recognize some of the methods that precision agriculture uses to achieve its aims. Here we have um, multi-spectral remote sensing, uh, hyperspectral imaging, um, so they're concerned with crop health, so that these are well familiar to us in archaeological prospection. On the soil side of things, on the soil health, Precision agriculture employs um, electrical, electromagnetic induction instruments, or EM instruments, which are also familiar to us. And there's one mounted on a, on a tractor. And it also engages in, in uh, soil sampling, so that's soil sample data to validate the results and also to help with the calibration of the instruments. Typical outputs from uh, precision ag are agriculture are um, management zone, the creation of management zones, which are map layers which are fed back into the controller to help with the application of variable rate um, applications. So, for example, fertilizing, um, seeding, tilling, or even irrigation. So at the bottom you can see some typical outputs which look fairly familiar. Um, it's all a about making decisions for the farmer. Um, the, the, the computers, are, um, sorry, the sensors uh, record the data and it's converted into these maps and then it's fed back into the um, onboard systems on the, in, in the tractors. And that is what controls the actual um, rate of application. Some more recent innovations is um, the mounting of the sensors actually on the tractor cabs. So instead of using the satellite imagery from uh, space or from, from or the, the multispectral imagery from say an airplane, it's being directly mounted onto vehicles. This means the application can be done in real time. So this is important for farming. They want their decisions instantaneously. Um, the, the sensors map out the front and then the application, it's all done in a matter of seconds and behind the tractor, the applications um, proceed. Another aspect to precision agriculture that's interesting is their use of in-situ monitoring. So they have weather stations collecting local um, weather's data and soil moisture and soil temperature as well. So these are all data types that are potentially available. Quickly just think about the soil, in, uh, soil properties of interest between the two domains. In archaeology we are interested in moisture and compaction, 
We survey with earth resistance, electrical magnetism, GPR, but also magnetic properties of the soil. Um, in precision agriculture, they're interested in the pH, but also moisture and compaction. So there's an obvious overlap, as well as nutrient balance. One of the big differences between the domains, though, is scale. In um, precision agriculture, their spatial resolution is what we would call low. We're interested in very much high resolution, so sub-meter sub -meter data. Temporally speaking, though they like high resolution, often um, surveys are repeated, so say maybe uh, electrical, um, so electrical conductivity survey might repeat it every four, five, six years, um, whereas some of the multispectral uh, surveys could be repeated up to three or four times within a, a growing season. So there's lots of data being collected and used. What happens to the data? Some of it is archived, all the de management decisions and the treatment plans are, are archived and can be reviewed to see if they're being effective or not. Um, what happens to the raw data is something we're still trying to find out. So, today I just want to take some simple examples of maybe how we can start thinking about what we could do to make our data more attractive to precision agriculture and vice versa. You know, is there a scope for us to, to share data in a useful manner? So I've picked, a, in the first instance, a, a resistance survey that was carried out 14 years ago. Um, the workflow, as we all know in archaeology, is pretty straightforward. We process the data, and then we identify areas of high and low resistance, and we use that to make our first translation into an archaeological interpretation. Okay? And then we categorize the responses that we're interested in into probable archaeology or, or possible archaeology, typical, typical categories like that. So I want to start thinking about this in uh, terms of agriculture. Could we make this data set more interesting for, uh, for agronomists or for farmers, for something that they could use in their, in their management plans? So first thing I've tried doing is downscaling the data to a resolution that they might find um, usable. So moving away from this high resolution to, to, to low resolution, in this instance I've just simply reclassified the data. You can see that it's not really, I'd really have to resample it, but it's just to make the point. And then I think, well, what are they interested in moisture? That's what they're looking at, the plants, they're looking at the soil. So I've converted that or translated that simply into a, a moisture map, high, mid-range, and low moisture. So maybe this is something that they could feed into a treatment plan or a, a, um, or a, a management zone. Similarly, I've tried to take it one step further and start thinking about what was the other parameter they're interested in, compaction. So moisture has a role in compaction, possibly. Maybe we need to add in some other data, possibly from soil, uh, soil sampling and then we can build up a compaction, so high, low, mid compaction. However, as we mentioned, farmers are being, and landowners, being asked increasingly to think about environmental factors and environmental variables. So we could start maybe thinking about the relationship between moisture and soil organic carbon. So in areas of um, low moisture, we might find a more stable carbon. So I've rejigged the translation to um, suggest areas where carbon may be more stable or less stable. Similarly, if we think about uh, soil strength, uh, which is also a parameter that is interested, uh, interesting to in the agri-environmental sense, um, it's also dependent on moisture to some extent, and I've tried to produce a vulnerability, a soil vulnerability risk map, um, where areas of soil vulnerability are highlighted. This could be strengthened, of course, by combining it with topographic data, maybe a slope map, um, and you can start thinking about erosion, and maybe there's also some uh, soil depth information that could be fed into it. Okay, so they're pretty simplistic examples, but the idea is just to say, uh, can we start thinking 
about making our data useful um, to, to people beyond ourselves. Second example is provided from the University of Ghent. Uh, this is a soil survey from Wales over sandy and wet heath, heathland. It's a, an EM survey, it's electrical conductivity, and you can see here there's a very, very little contrast in these results. So disappointing in that respect. However, from our point of view, it's quite interesting because um, electrical conductivity is often used in agriculture. But in agriculture, the magnetic data set, so the magnetic susceptibility data set that is actually uh, collected simultaneously with this is generally not used or underused and it's ignored. But in this site, because the conditions are good, we get a very nice contrast. There's a lot of, of contrast visible in the magnetic susceptibility data. None of it is archaeological, so it's of no interest really to us. However, for a farmer or a landowner, there should be some potential in this, um, based on the fact that there has been a, a known link between iron oxides um, and its role in, in the fixation of certain nutrients in the soil. So this is a link that's been demonstrated in certain circumstances. So by uh, uh, using the magnet magnetic susceptibility bank, it might be possible for the farmer to draw some conclusions about the spread of certain minerals um, within the soil here. Okay. So finally, for the uh, last example, I wanted to think about taking a data set from, that might be collected in precision agriculture and thinking how it might be useful in archaeology. Um, I wanted to sh use data set that was collected as a pilot study by um, my colleague Rachel and another colleague from the University of York, Nick Wilson, who is both an archaeologist and a farmer. So he has a farm and this is a typical maybe not a typical, but this is a data set that he would might collect um, in regards to farming. So not this one here, this is just a Fluxgate one. But this is the results of um, a Fluxgate gradeometer survey over known archaeology. So you can see there's definitely archaeological features there. On the right is a gamma ray, spectros a spectro gamma ray spectroscopy instrument. I'm hoping to hear more about this later because I think there's a geochemical um, talk coming up. But this is something that's uh, becoming more and more use in agriculture. Um, and it's used, it measures the total surface radiation of the soil. So it targets specifically the topsoil, so the upper 30 centimetres. And it uses the total surface radiation, so as I understand it, that's the rate of decay or the decay of the, of the soil in, in the topsoil. And then it produces up to 27 different layers of information. Okay, here are some of them. They're macronutrients, micronutrients, um, which might be useful in, in agriculture, but they bear very real little relationship to the archaeology. This is possibly because the archaeology is too deep or the resolution, which is one by one meter, is insufficient to pick it up. However, I'm wondering if this could be useful to heritage management. So rather than a prospection tool, a mapping tool, I'm wondering if a data set like this could be useful for archaeological monitoring. Could we deduce from this that the archaeology is not in the plough zone? So it's not at, at risk of being ploughed, because this is a ploughed field. So that's one thing. Another thing we could think about is if there were known um, cemeteries here or graves, what about the bone preservation? So I've pulled up the pH map from the, from the, the gamma ray spectroscopy, the spectronomy, and um, could we think about if there's no uh, cemetery here, is it at risk? What are the pH levels telling us? We know from cons uh, conversations with heritage managers that uh, a lot of metal detectorists are reporting a deterioration in copper alloy fines. So the heritage managers are now wondering, is this due to a pH change? 
And if it is due to a pH change or a change in pH, is it because of farming practices or is it something bigger than this? Is it perhaps climate change? Okay, so this could potentially maybe help give some answers. Um, final point, we spoke about monitoring of soil temperature and air temperature in farming. Uh, increases in, in soil temperature have been demonstrated to um, speed up the rate of deterioration of bone in the soil. So here is potentially uh, another monitoring data set for archaeologists. So to conclude, um, the point of today's exercise is not to present any perfect uh, data sets, they're just ideas about what we could do and to get everybody thinking, especially in light of the fact we're thinking about the next 25 years of archaeological prospection, what can we do with our data? Can we make it more uh, useful outside of our own discipline, for example, in sustainable land management, and thereby, and I know there's, I think there's a, a session, you see for here, about demonstrating our value in, in the wider, in the wider scope, and um, can we demonstrate our value?